Hello, I'm here to talk to you about a very important cardiac procedure. But first, let me go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Ravi Dave. I'm a professor of medicine at UCLA, and I'm the director of interventional cardiology at UCLA Health. Today, I'm going to be talking about a procedure that's performed very often in cardiology. The procedure is called coronary angiography. Uh, oftentimes, the angiography procedure is followed by a stent placement as well. So I'll be talking briefly about both of these procedures. This is a very common procedure, as I mentioned, and a lot of questions often come up when I talk to patients. So the purpose of this presentation is to help answer any questions you have after you visited your doctor or prior to visiting your doctor in case you're having this procedure done. We'll, be, we'll also be taking some questions at the very end as well, so if you have any questions, feel free to send them over. So first, let's start with the basics. What is a coronary angiography procedure? So uh, you have a slide over here that you can also reference to. A coronary angiogram is an invasive procedure. It's not done in the office. It's generally done in the hospital, where catheters are placed in your blood vessels that reach up to your heart and your coronary arteries. We inject x-ray dye through these coronary vessels to visualize the arteries to, and we detect any plaque or any cholesterol buildup that has occurred in these arteries. As I mentioned, this is performed in a hospital. It can be a same-day procedure. Oftentimes, it's also an overnight procedure, so you have to be prepared for that as well. And uh, this procedure can, may lead to further uh, procedures such as stent placement. So who needs a coronary angiogram? Obviously, you're looking at this because you may have uh, been told you need an angiogram or one of your friends or loved ones needs an angiogram. So an angiogram is performed in someone who has either known or suspected coronary artery disease or heart disease blockages. It's also done for evaluation of chest pain. In fact, that's one of the most common reasons why people have a coronary angiogram. The chest pain is often evaluated by a stress test. Uh, and a stress test, if, it's come, if it is determined to be an abnormal stress test, this will lead to a coronary angiogram. It's also done prior to a very risky uh, procedure or a major procedure, especially procedures that's going to require hours of anesthesia and if you happen to have risk factors that would put you at risk for having a heart attack during these procedures, either during the surgery or after the surgery. Um, it's also done uh, prior to valve replacement or valve repair procedures. Uh, it's done in this particular scenario to make sure that there are no blockages in the arteries that would put you at risk for uh, this particular uh, complex procedure. Also, it allows a surgeon to fix your arteries while they are doing the valve procedure. This also, uh, procedure is also done as a part of evaluation for patients who develop congestive heart failure. As you know, congestive heart failure is a rapidly increasing problem and requires many days of hospitalization. So it is important to find out the reason for the weakness of the heart muscle that has led to congestive heart failure. By doing a coronary angiogram, oftentimes we find blockages that can be fixed, which can be reversed and blood flow can be reestablished, and as a result, the congestive heart failure has a much better outcome. It can also be done uh, to assess for patients who have spasm of the arteries. Uh, it is um, uh, often one of the only ways to identify if a patient has this condition. So how do you prepare for a coronary angiogram procedure? This is probably the most frequently asked question to me, and oftentimes patients ask me, uh, the day of the procedure because as you're getting ready for the procedure, you forget to ask about this particular issue. Uh, the preparation is very minimal for this procedure. You have to fast uh, after midnight, so no water or, any, or anything to eat prior to, mid, uh, to the day of the procedure. Uh, you have to, you're allowed to take some medications, especially your heart medications, uh, if they are approved by our physician. Uh, oftentimes we mention to take these medications with a sip of water. However, there are some medications that you don't want to take prior to this procedure as it may increase the risk of complications during the procedure. These medications include blood thinners such as Coumadin, uh, the newer blood thinners such as Pradaxa, Xarelto, Eliquis. 
Uh, the reason why you want to stop these medications is because it increases the risk of bleeding during a coronary angiography procedure. Uh, for the newer medications such as Pradaxa, Zarelto, and uh, Eliquis, you can stop them 48 hours prior to the procedure. With Coumadin, it may uh, take two or three days uh, to, to have the effect out. So oftentimes, we request you to stop the medication three or four days prior to the procedure. In some patients, if you stop Coumadin, you have to go on an, uh, on an intramuscular injection such as Lovenox. So check with your doctor if you need any additional support to bridge you uh, for any blood thinning prior to the procedure. You're also advised to stop medications such as metformin as the metformin can cause some problems with your kidneys. Uh, do check with your doctor because we don't want your blood sugar to be very high uh, if, you're not taking, if you've not taken the metformin prior to the procedure. You also want to avoid uh, medications that are often used for erectile uh, dysfunction such as Viagra or Cialis because oftentimes we use a medication during the procedure that interacts severely with these medications causing your blood pressure to go down. So don't take these medications at least 48 hours prior to the procedure. It is completely okay for you to continue taking your aspirin, Plavix, Berlinta, Effian medications that are also considered to be blood thinners but they work on your platelets. These medications are important because unlike the other blood thinners we talked about, these medications actually reduce your risk of complications during the procedure. So we don't want you to stop these medications. So it's very important to get your medication list out, have a nurse or doctor go through the list and check to make sure if every medication is okay or not okay to take. Sometimes we even ask you to stop taking certain vitamins or certain supplements because they increase your risk of bleeding. So it's important to go through not just your regular list of medications, but also any supplements you may be taking. Be prepared to have somebody drive you home because oftentimes you're not in the right shape to drive back home either because you received some sedation during the procedure or your procedure site may prevent you from driving safely back home. As I mentioned, a coronary angiogram is an invasive procedure, so there are some risks associated with the procedure. However, the risks are very minimal. This procedure is done very frequently, oftentimes during a day in a hospital. So um, it is a, a rapid procedure, but there are some risks that you need to know. The risk of bleeding, infection, dye allergy is, is very rare, less than 1%. There are some major complications that do occur, a stroke, a heart attack, or sometimes patients can even die during this procedure. However, the risk of this is extremely low. We're talking about one in 10,000 patients. You could also have injury to the blood vessels as we are entering your blood vessels to do this procedure. Sometimes patients need some vascular procedures to correct these complications. There are also possibility of a kidney uh, dysfunction or damage from the x-ray dye. If you have kidney problems to begin with, uh, your risk is obviously increased. So it's important to ask about your risk for kidney um, dysfunction prior to this procedure. Oftentimes patients can develop heart arrhythmias. These are generally transient and can be treated during the procedure with some additional medications. It's very important to sort of have your mind relaxed when you come for, to the hospital for this procedure. As a result, I've prepared some slides for you to be at ease uh, and, and to expect uh, and to, to be prepared in terms of what to expect prior to having this procedure. When you walk into the hospital as it's an outpatient procedure, uh, a same day procedure, you will often uh, go into uh, our outpatient admissions unit, which is, looks something like this, where someone will help take some information, uh, get you uh, all registered for the procedure, and, and it's a very quick uh, process. After that, you'll be taken to the pre-procedure unit. It's called different uh, names in different uh, medical centers, but a pre-procedure unit is where you will have a bed similar to that uh, with uh, some monitoring um, areas next to it. Uh, that's where you will be asked to remove your clothing. Uh, you know, uh, you'll be asked more questions about your medications. It's important to bring your medications, not just the list, but your, all your medications with you for the procedure. This is where an IV will be 
insert it to give you some intravenous fluids and some medications to help you relax prior to the procedure. For your uh, relatives, patients, loved ones, there is a waiting room uh, where they will be waiting while you are undergoing the procedure and the physician will come and talk to you in this waiting room to give you the information of what transpired during the procedure, the outcomes, etc. So there is a designated area for that. Once you're ready for the procedure, you're taken to the catheterization suite, which is the procedure suite where the procedure is performed. It looks similar to an operating room. However, um, it's, it's the procedure is done under x-ray, so you'll have a, a, a bed where you'll be lying down with some x-ray equipment on top of you for us to help image your arteries. There are multiple screens that you'll be seeing uh, on your side where we'll be constantly looking at to look at uh, the, the procedure details as we are uh, getting them. Uh, oftentimes, you can look at these screens. I would encourage not for you to kind of look over and try to look at the screen because it may interfere with the procedure. It may put you at increased risk of bleeding uh, with some increased pressure by changing your position. It may also interfere with the physician uh, uh, while, while they're performing the procedure. When you're having the procedure done, the procedure is done generally through two major routes. It's either done through your brachial artery, uh, through your radial artery, uh, as you can see over here, which is uh, performed through your wrist, or your femoral artery, which is on the next slide. By both of these uh, techniques, the catheters are put up to the heart, and then the coronary arteries, as they are shown in the next slide, uh, are imaged using injection of the x-ray dye. Catheters are very thin plastic catheters. They're very flexible. Um, they almost look like, uh, feel like uh, a slightly uh, cooked spaghetti. Uh, flexible, but they don't break. Uh, we put these catheters in the origin of the coronary arteries, and then we ex inject x-ray dye to see uh, if there is any evidence of blockage, how the arteries are looking, if there is any anomaly with the arteries. Uh, this is a picture of the arteries on the left side, uh, which generally branch off into two major vessels. And the picture next to uh, that is a, a picture of uh, an angiogram of the right coronary artery. So what happens after the procedure? Generally, the physician will mention to you at the end of the procedure how everything went, if there were any complications, and what were the findings. Um, you may return to either the outpatient unit to go home the same day or to the inpatient unit in case the doctor feels you need some additional hospitalization. There are three possible outcomes after the procedure is performed. The physician may review your arteries uh, on the coronary angiogram and determine that all you need is some medications, and uh, with adjustment of the medications, your blockages can be either controlled or can be uh, regressed uh, over time, uh, or the blockages are such that no further intervention is needed. So that is the first possible outcome. The second outcome could be that the physician determines that you need to have a balloon or a stent procedure performed to help improve the blood flow to that area. Generally, that procedure unless complicated, is performed right following the angiogram procedure. So the physician will mention to you, well, here's the blockage that we have identified and we would like to fix it with a balloon or a stent procedure. The third possible outcome is that the physician may decide that your blockages are so extensive or so complex that the only way to fix them would be to perform open heart surgery or bypass surgery. So those are the three possible outcomes you may want to prepare yourself for. Again. Uh, the physician, it would be good to ask the physician if there is any indication in terms of uh, one possibility or the other to help you better prepare for the procedure. After discharge, a detailed instructions will be given to you about your diet, about your medications, about your exercise, activity, and travel. So do uh, make sure that you get that, uh, which will help uh, prevent further questions when you go home in case you have some travel plan in 10 days or two weeks. It's better to get a clearance uh, from the physician. Now I'm going to talk about um, stent uh, procedures which are often performed in patients 
when a coronary angiogram determines that there is a very severe narrowing in one of the arteries. Uh, so what is a stent? A stent is a mesh tube that is used to treat arteries that have been narrowed because of cholesterol buildup over the years. Uh, stents are part of a procedure that use balloons and other devices to treat narrowed arteries. Uh, by placing a stent, the blockage is opened up and blood flow is restored to the heart muscle. So the heart starts beating much more normally. If you have symptoms of chest pain or shortness of breath, they are relieved as well because your heart's having more blood flow. Stents are made out of metal and they do not cause any rejection. Almost all stents that are used now are safe to undergo MRI procedures as, as quick as within two weeks of stent placement. However, it is important to have uh, to retain a card that you'll be given after the procedure that helps the radiologist determine if they are MRI safe or not. The newer stents have medications on it and as a result they prevent scar tissue from developing and re-narrowing uh, in the stented areas. One of the things that happened when we were using the previous forms of stents was that oftentimes within a three or six month period patients would come back with recurrent symptoms and when we performed an angiogram again, we would identify that there would be scar tissue that had formed and as a result of the scar tissue, you would have to retreat the blood vessel. Well, the newer stents that we have have medications inside the stents and as a result of the medication, scar tissue is not formed and that problem no longer occurs. A very newer type of stent that's also available at UCLA is a stent that completely dissolves after about six months to a year. There are a lot of advantages because you're not leaving any foreign material inside your arteries. These stents are made with the same type of material that are often used for sutures that surgeons use inside the body that stay in there to do the work but after a while the sutures are gone and as a result um, uh, uh, the body has no longer any foreign material inside. Some quick pictures uh, about stents. As you can see, they're very small. A human artery is generally between two to four millimeters in diameter. So it's very, very small in diameter. And the stents, as you can see, are, are much, much smaller than your finger. They're probably at the same size as a ballpoint refill. Uh, these stents go inside these narrowed arteries. And once they're expanded, they stay expanded and make sure the blockage doesn't come back. This is a picture of uh, one of the procedures done at UCLA where a patient had a blockage right here. The patient had a lot of chest pain which led to a heart attack. And after this was identified, a stent was placed. And as you can see in the following picture, um, if you didn't know that there was a blockage prior to uh, this procedure, you would not even have expected it. But um, the, the blockage is completely resolved and as a result, um, the blood flow is reestablished. Well, uh, I hope this short introduction about the angiography procedure and the stent procedure is helpful to you. Plan your procedure and help answer any questions you may have. Obviously, uh, there are, if you have any more questions, it's best to ask your physician uh, or the physician assistant who is helping you prepare for the procedure. Uh, you can also look for more information at the UCLA International Cardiology website. Um, but at this time, I'd be happy to see if there are any questions. Thank you. Um, the question that I have here is, um, with an extremely blocked coronary artery with risk of cardiac arrest, do you recommend angioplasty or medication therapy first to clear out arteries? Well, the best way to treat a coronary artery that is severely narrowed, anything more than 60 to 70 percent, um, is to treat, get treatment with a, uh, angioplasty in a stent procedure. Oftentimes when patients do come in a cardiac arrest situation, we perform urgent angiography and we find that a culprit artery has caused uh, blockage and as a result cardiac arrest and uh, we go ahead and we fix the artery and help improve the patient's chances of recovery following the cardiac arrest. So yes, it can be safely performed even in a cardiac arrest situation. The next question I have is, can angioplasty cure coronary artery disease? Well, coronary artery disease is a chronic condition. You cannot cure it. You have to constantly 
do things that will help reduce your risk of progression of coronary artery disease. This is where your lifestyle modifications, good diet, exercise, taking your medications regularly, visiting your doctor on a regular basis come into play. But stents and angioplasty, what they do per do is they help overcome a severe narrowing of the artery and as a result um, they can help improve your symptoms that are coming from the coronary artery disease. Um, another question I have here is that um, what causes a stroke uh, during the procedure? Well, like I mentioned, coronary angiography is a very safe procedure. Uh, a stroke is a very rare complication. Uh, oftentimes patients who have blockages in their arteries often have blockages or cholesterol deposits in their aorta and the carotid arteries and when we are manipulating these catheters into your blood vessels, sometimes these cholesterol plaques can break off and they travel to the brain and can cause some stroke uh, like uh, issues. We can also have a stroke from certain, time, certain types of medications that can cause excessive bleeding. But like I mentioned, this happens extremely rarely and uh, it's important to know about it. Uh, it's, uh, the risks are slightly higher if you've had a prior stroke in the past, but if you don't have any of that, then you don't, uh, the risk is extremely low. Uh, the other question I have is uh, with diabetes and um, kidney uh, problems, is my risk higher for a coronary angiography procedure? Yes, if you do have kidney problems that are existing, uh, it is important to make sure you speak to your physician as certain medications uh, can help slightly lower your risk of kidney problems following an angiography. You can also uh, be better prepared for the angiography procedure. Oftentimes, we ask you to have uh, very lit limited fluid restriction prior to the procedure. We give you intravenous fluids before, during, and after the coronary uh, procedure. Uh, this will help uh, reduce your risk of kidney problems. So it would be very important to check with your doctor or mention to your doctor if you've had previous kidney problems. Now, the doctors do check, physicians do check your kidney function prior to the procedure. So even if you're unaware of any kidney problems and if they are existing, we will be detecting that. So you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the next question I have here is, will I need a blood transfusion during the procedure? Uh, the risk of bleeding, as I mentioned, is very little. Uh, you generally have about 15 to 30 cc's of blood loss, uh, and that is generally very well tolerated by the body. And what it does, uh, your body recovers that uh, within a day. So there is generally no need for blood transfusion. We, are, we don't even prepare patients for the need for blood transfusion, and it's only performed extremely rarely. Uh, as there are no further questions at this time, uh, I would like to conclude uh, at this point. Again, I would encourage you to uh, listen to this webinar again because I did go quite fast over everything and uh, also go to our website where there is a lot of important information available for you to uh, look at and uh, there are, uh, there's other sources of information about other cardiac conditions as well. Um, so um, I encourage you to do that. Well, thank you again for your time and I uh, hope you have a great day.